Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be with you. And um, only sorry not to be in Warsaw itself. Um, and congratulations on this initiative, um, which I hope you can expand in time and perhaps meet each other physically as we continue to work on this uh, exciting area of the economy of attention. Um, much of what I have to say is has much in common with your last seminar on on brand communication in Spain. And I was I listened to it in recording. I couldn't be present when I was there, and I was struck by how similar and some some of their conclusions are to mine. Next slide, please. Okay. However, my perspective is entirely different. Um, I'm not an economist, I'm a communication studies specialist and a semiotician. But what I'm trying to do is shift the paradigm around the economy of attention. So these are some of my key points. So the way that the economy of attention has been conceived by Simon Davenport, Abitz and many others, is, is linked to the idea that there is a large quantity of information, almost infinite quantity of information, and a limited quantity of attention. Therefore, it still remains within the paradigm of supply and demand, within a liberal theory of value. And uh, what I'm interested in is perhaps shifting this paradigm and I'm going to give you some reasons today as to why that paradigm should be shifted. This process is, of course, linked to the fact of abundance, that digitization leads to abundance. Uh, a digital song can be reproduced infinitely, and its property can't be inherited. Uh, it, it doesn't go beyond the death of the individual. It's, it's sold as an experience. And therefore, in that process, it seems to me, the demand is increasingly organized around what I call identity habits, forming and shaping identities. And this is also linked to a transformation of economy. We only have to look at an economy like Sweden, which has built itself recently, has transformed itself from an industrial economy to a more postmodern economy, where brands such as most famous, of course, is Ikea, H&M, COS, and so on, are global brands, present retail sites across the world, but where their, um, their production is not in Sweden, but the brand is managed in the Sweden. And so that what we increasingly see is multinational corporations managing global brands. Um, and so in this process, um, the key element becomes the capacity to commodify attention and to commodify attention uh, and that allows the generation of economic value. Uh, my argument is that brands do this because they do not just transmit information but that they shape our ways of being shape our, our structure. And the other argument I'm arguing is that in some ways, following Hilburn's argument, Benoit Hilburn, is that they are a form of government. And that nation states, they take some ways, some of the role that nation states paid before. So they're the main lines of my argument. Now I'm going to go into more detail on the argument. What I wanted to say is I'm very open to questions during my talk. So if someone doesn't understand my point or would like me to elaborate, please do not hesitate to um, raise your hand and speak. Next slide, please. So there is nothing more intimate than human attention. It is the most intimate part of a human being in many ways. So Yet this intimate nature of the individual and of societies, in fact, is becoming a key element in the calculation of value. Um, 
And if we look at the tech brands, the tech companies, the many of them, their stock value is not linked as industrial brands were to their dividend, uh, as much as a sort of belief in their capacity to generate economic returns through controlling attention. This is perhaps disputable. I'd be interested in your ideas about this. Now, many scholars in communications, notably Nick Caldry and Ulysses Measures, have called this process colonial. They use the term data colonialism. And they argue that we are no longer simply extracting products, coal, uh, minerals from the ground, that capitalism has moved to a form of extraction of data. And that data or human attention, they don't use the term attention much, is a natural resource. That human attention is a natural resource that is being extracted and managed much as in previous times, in the last century and centuries before, we extracted minerals. My own argument is that this process is about the manufacturing of identities, often linked to emotional states, in an attempt to colonize our deepest intimacy, our attention. Next slide, please. So here's my proposition. And I'll repeat this a couple of times, I'm afraid. What if attention produced value in itself? So, and it produced value by shaping habit. And that itself is the basis of branding. So the two theories that have dominated our theories of value in the 19th and 20th century are uh, free market theory, that value is constituted through supply and demand, and Marxist theory, that value is constituted by labor. But the idea of constituting value as being produced by attention fits with neither of those paradigms. Next slide, please. So if we look at the commodification of attention historically, we see that it is linked very much to branding and also to infrastructure, to systems of transport. So for example, brands really developed in the United States in the 19th century linked to railway distribution, which allowed people across the United States, at least the areas that were served by railroads, to have the same goods distributed and led at the same time, some of the first mass media magazines like Lady Holmes Journal were being distributed by these train lines, allowing advertising. J. Walter Thompson in develop perhaps the first advertisements, buying the back page of, of, of Lady's Home Journal, and then persuading companies to advertise products and telling them how to brand them, such as the famous Menon Talcum. So there's a connection between media transport and the construction of branding. And just as globalization itself has been linked to the containership and the transformation of branding through the easy and cheap circulation of goods through container ships. And this is exacerbated by e-commerce, by our capacity to buy online, to have things cheaply exported and cheaply transported from delocalized centers of production. Next slide, please. Then how do brands trade in attention? They, they, they trade in attention by producing audiences. So many political economists of audiences, such as Dallas Smythe and Christian Fuchs, who I will speak about a little later, um, um, uh, will argue that um, brands co-opt 
attention. Media, television concerned attracting people's attention by having programs and those programs got people's attention and then one passed advertising in the gaps between the ads. So in that process, of course, there's a famous example, I think of in Poland in the um, 80s, the regime used uh, Kojak on Sunday mornings, an American TV show to sort of counter program against the Catholic Church. Um, and the whole idea then that what it was is about producing attention used strategically. Um, and, and television could offer the attention of the consumers and sell it to uh, the audience. Um, that structure collapsed with the technical innovation of digitization, the digitization of television, the introduction of remote controls, the introduction of TiVo, where one could cut out advertising from programs, that model collapsed in favor of the CNN loop model, or in the favor of the capacity to see programs at different times. So then what has happened to attention? So brands now, rather than simply buying attention um, have, have become systems for establishing and structuring habit and then of course in forming subjectivity forming our ways of being human beings can you give me the next slide so i've already the next slide please so Brands used to work through serialization. So Procter & Gamble transformed American domestic life by introducing bleachers, soaps, cleanliness products, the image of a clean house uh, in Italy in the 1950s. Television began by introducing these products uh, in television shows where consumers in peasant communities had to guess prices um so the watching and then often in television shows procter and gramble was this you know soap company that started producing firstly with radio soap operas and then in television so they linked and constructed sort of imaginary worlds which people could see themselves which access was through the media but also through the the brand um so these brands were, however, very much linked to the construction of a national imaginary, a natural process. Next slide, please. Uh, so here we go back to what you had in the last um, talk by our colleagues from, from Barcelona, that um, we can refer to Benedict Anderson and the idea of um, national imaginaries, imagined communities. Uh, so famously in Italy, the most popular program was advertising 15 minutes at the end of the day, I'm talking in the 1960s, uh, where all advertising was connected in a program, which everyone watched together. So there's this whole idea of simultaneously watching progress. Of course, Anderson talks about how news and information also talked about what happened simultaneously in one day. So this idea that television allowed the construction of simultaneity around products and the idea of a national community and then products were marketed nationally begins to, is in the process of transforming. Next slide, please. So then I, uh, I mentioned that, you know, Anderson argues along with Elizabeth Eisenstein and others that the um in some ways media replaced religion uh, saying the newspaper is the realist prayer quoting hegel saying that uh so in this process we've seen the transformation of attention moving perhaps uh from religion to politics to consumption um and collective identity around shared experiences firstly in religion then in politics and then in consumption and the production of this attention then becomes uh, a, a construction of economic value so 
there is a tendency moving towards the experience of global similarity and global imagined communities which are organized by transnational media systems such as brand but so we can think of Netflix doing this, Netflix starting to produce a major number of programs in Turkish, which are exported to the United States, to England, all around the world, um, producing this sense of no longer just a national consumption of national products, but a global products. We're not there by any fans at a global simultaneity, but there's a move in that direction. And we can see other phenomena who have a similar structure to the branding, such as ISIS or Daesh, uh, religious fanaticism, which produced a sort of global brand through social media. So this idea that audiences produce attention has been taken up by Smythe many years ago, saying that audiences are doing work when they watch television and should be paid for it. And this idea is more recently developed by Christian Fuchs at the University of Westminster, arguing that social media audiences should be paid for giving their data, should be paid for giving their attention. Next slide, please. So, um, however, habits produced by watching television have always produced measurable audiences. So already in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, Telefirm became a system for measuring audience and managing and offering prizes where people would interact or voting for talent on talent shows uh, using mobile phones, produced a massive amount of data that allowed those audiences, just when they were most active, to become objects, that is, measurable data, um, and then could be sold for value. So the very idea is just as moments as audiences became active, they were able to be measured. Okay, so and television programs could be designed to produce those target audiences, measure them and sell them. Uh, and as that process developed, we, be, we had narrow casting with increasing numbers of television stations, multiplication of channels, we had the, the massive explosion of magazines, and then with the internet, this process continues, where we can get more and more smaller but also larger and larger audiences which can be measured and whose attention can be measured and indeed now as my colleague Claudio Rodo who's the co-editor of the book I wrote communication scarcity is attention scarcity in the communications era can discuss even how eye movements can be measured now while people are computers to measure their attention in order to sell that attention to um, to networks Sorry, two brands. Next slide. Okay, so um, we've already touched on this of streaming, the, the disappearance. So, and this, this, this structure that the new media developed of a destructured experience of time and disrupted national attention markets. So brands have become more important in this process than they were before because before media provided the attention, brands now have to produce attention that they can measure themselves more and more rather than simply buying it. Mm -hmm. So then in a certain sense, brands are becoming media. Brands are now what television was before or remains. It's a sedimentary process. One doesn't replace the other. One becomes a sediment upon another. Next slide, please. So digital brands become increasingly publishers, but not only digital brands. So, you know, uh, Facebook, Google, uh, of course, uh, produce content, but, but a company such as Red Bull selling an energy drink has become a largely a publishing company producing content. So brands increasingly produce more and more content, produce uh, stories, and indeed produce events. So if we look at the history of Red Bull's marketing, it produced events without even paying for them to be reported. And in this case, co-opting social media users to circulate the knowledge of those events and to, to, to invoke their participation in those events. So 
then brand stories and content become increasingly involved in media content, both through product placement in, in movies, in series, but also uh, through stories. So we can see this, as I'll talk a little bit later, about uh, an example of a brand such as Virgin, where Richard Branson, the CEO, constructs himself as a hero with the whole series of stories as David versus Goliath in every situation. He's, he uses that metaphor. So consumers are then encouraged or co-opted to become brand ambassadors, to active generator of brand content. So increasingly then, moving away from the old model of media producing the content that people would want to watch, that producing attention, then television stations selling that attention, we move to a thing where we're, the economic model involves co-opting consumers to become producers of content for the brand. That in that sense, they model the structure of Facebook, which has transferred the production of content from a commercial paid operation to amateurs doing it for free. Similarly, in the pornography industry has moved from um, production to, to amateurs. Next stage. So I like to use the term shifting, or in French we use the word débrayage, which is even more interesting, meaning like a, a car shifter in the car when you have gears. Or this was used by Ramad Jakobsen, the famous linguist. Um, and I think it's interesting is that once one has accumulating attention around identities, one can shift it from one thing to another. I like to think of attention as a type of conglomerate it can be moved from one object to another. And as it moves, it produces value. A very simple example would be an haute couture brand that shifted its meaning to mass consumption of perfume or lipstick. There is no actually link between those products, but what it was a shift of connotations. So that uh, having attracted attention through um, through high fashion, it was able to then move that to other areas. Indeed, it's argued now that haute couture, high fashion, um, is only maintained by companies like Dior as a system of maintaining attention and brand status. So, uh, so brand content is increasingly integrated into normal media, shifting then moves the meaning from one object to another, from one product to another, and transforms the meaning around a second object. Mm -hmm. So I'll explain this further with when I discuss the Virgin model, but Virgin moved from being a company selling uh, vinyl records to being many things in 40 countries, but including banks. So it became more and more abstract. The product became more and more intangible, but the brand, its story, its myth, and its structure remain the same. This is, of course, what we can call brand extension, okay? So, for example, the cigarette company Marlboro built, started doing clothing uh, because it had this sort of image of rugged masculine identity, so they produced masculine clothing, uh, where they had no expertise in it whatsoever, but somehow that image moved. Next slide, please. And so hence brand has become an increasingly important part in estimating the intangible value of corporations. For, for leading brands, it's worth more than 50% of their value. So to quote Adam Avinson, uh, brand value stands for intangible resources, for uh, the social standing, the trendiness. So these become intangible because they are beyond the direct control and unclear in the accounting system. This is then linked to what we call the third bottom line, right? That is the ethical structure um, or the ethical messaging that's produced. A company like Caring, which is the Pinot, the large uh, luxury conglomerate, have moved itself into, even in their title, Caring, even though it's spelt with a K and not a C, um, have moved to a concept of being engaged in political and social causes as, as a part of their uh, 
framework, building themselves this intangible brand capital around what you might call moral capital. Okay, so the brand then increasingly faces itself as being an interface between consumers and objects. It's a designing a set of relationship, and this re designing this relationship produces value. Next slide, please. Okay, any questions before I go on? Is it clear? No questions, so I'll keep going. So one of the most obvious and clear examples of brand shifting is the company Virgin. So, uh, so you know, originally a music production company it built a framework around a sort of narrative of taking on big business, taking on the record brands, then the airline taking on British Airways, the attempt to create a Coca-Cola company, which was called Virgin Cola, buying a small bank and producing something called Virgin Money, and most recently, of course, offering space travel. Um, so many of these, uh, there is no connection between these types of products. The only connection is one of meaning, okay? The only connection, if you like, is something completely intangible linked to this sort of myth of the brand. Um, Branston became also like a sort of sign of the brand. So he opposed fox hunting, establishment values, supposedly linking himself as a democratic source of value. Um, but these events, including the space travel, are designed to capture media and public attention, um, to produce political and social couple, and then link them to the brand. Okay, uh, so it moved more and more to thingless areas of banking and insurance, with high profitability and lower investment. Next page, please. Uh -huh. So the transferring of connotations from one product to another, indeed, if we want to call it the, what I will call later, the dragging of attention from one place to another. Okay. So therefore, this produced a system where originally, when they began the um, um, structure and planning of, of Virgin Records, began as a sort of revolutionary brand against the big uh, corporate music brands, using the red flag as a symbol of a revolution, all right? Moving it away from being a historical narrative of communism to simply just consumer revolution of challenging established consumer vectors and established corporations, has now that red flag is now used as a model for their bank, Virgin Money. So, and also, you know, interesting enough, transforming the name from using bank establishment to simply saying what it's about, virgin money. So the paradox of associating money with a red flag typically attracts attention. So one of the things, of course, about a branding and an economy of attention is to constantly produce paradoxes, because paradoxes capture attention as one tries to understand. So it's so. Uh, so the, we again and again, we've seen with the adherence to a narrative of revolutionary ideals is transferred to the sale of commodities. We could look at how the image of Che Guevara is used for this. We can look at many other narratives uh, about how the 1968 student revolutions uh, narrative images have been used in branding and so on. So this is all about acknowledging what Jean-Marie Dru calls disruption producing disruption in the communication, producing disruption in the habits of daily life. Jean-Marie Dru drew from the French 1960s and 70s revolutionaries known as the situationist. That is, it, social change would occur through disrupting habits. These ideas were taken by former situationists such as Carlo Freccero, who then went to work for Berlusconi in Italy, arguing that um, for disruption of social habits and then transferring a public 
again, we've seen this model of transferring or shifting where television audiences were dragged from being television audiences for Berlusconi's television stations towards his political party or where soccer fans and soccer fan clubs were dragged to becoming supporters for his political movement. So this process of shifting and dragging constitutes value, not just in a purely economic value, but also in the construction, if you like, of political value. And the relationship between these domains is, is complex and shifting. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, one key concept developed by Georg Frankel, who I strongly encourage to invite to this seminar, who's an Austrian theorist of, of um, attention, he um, is that this problem concept he has of attention income. So encouraging identifications ran through stories and symbols established this social relation distinction. But it's also a system of offering consumers the capacity to attract attention to themselves. So the whole idea is that the brand allows you to get attention. And so the brand offers you, tries to get your attention, but then it tells the consumer how they can attract attention, how, and by attracting that attention, they can attract what John Berger used to call the envy of others, or they can imagine themselves being envied, right? And needing this type of uh, attention income. Uh -huh. So this process uh, of um, assuring attention income, so that when one buys the products, one attracts the attention, but then one assure, uh, maintains the idea that one will keep attracting attention. Next slide. So, um, you know, Abercrombie's and Fitch is an American brand, which paradoxically sells t-shirts by, uh, with images of men not wearing shirts um, in the entrance of their stores. It broke the convention of clothing merchandising and obviously attracts attention. Uh, this then links to a brand of myth and connotations of difference and daring. People show their allegiance to this brand by wearing t-shirts, uh, wearing their name in the street and maintaining that order. Yet at the same time, the customer aspires to the aesthetics and ethics of, of Abercrombie and Fitch as being part of a collective group, which follows a brand. Next slide. Okay, so there's the entrance to an Abercrombie and Fitch showing uh, all of these shirtless men um, as being something that produces brand capital to sell t-shirts at a high expensive price, uh, but not showing the product. Next slide, please. So uh, another concept that uh, links to this is concept I've already mentioned, which is that of brand drag, audience drag and brand drag. I mentioned already in terms of Berlusconi, how you can drag an audience from politics into from football into politics. Uh, we've seen in Turkey with everyone dragging religious audiences into politics. So this whole idea of shifting and dragging audience or dragging attention from one area to another. Um, so uh, consumers are often profiled on social media as they give attention to the brand which can then be dragged towards other products. So for example, in Paris, where I live, we have the défilé, the big fashion catwalk shows. And these have increasingly transformed for something which used to be about showcasing fashion products, showcasing fashion clothes, to becoming events which the people who are in the audience are constantly producing selfies about themselves and circulating those stories. So it's moved from being an event where media could photograph clothes, it's still that, but to be an event which is also about people co-opting the brand, using the brand and generating images of themselves around that. So this capacity to mobilize attention 
all right? It's not just like buying uh, airtime by advertisers. It's a capacity to try and get, to be able to get consumers to be media makers, to produce value. So brands not only bring attention, they generate it and drag it. Brands seek to disrupt the habits of other brands, principally. So much branding is not about advertising one's product, but simply it's about disrupting another brand and attracts attention to themselves by creating both habits of communication and habits of consumption. These in terms produce what we can call social subjectivity or what Hannah Arendt called ethical surplus the sense of belonging to a community and producing a community, which itself becomes a producer of value. So we can see this in uh, the case of LBGT plus and so on. We can see how community produces value. We could look at the Black Lives Meta marketing link by Nike uh, and so on. But this links with the whole idea of um, O'Green that brands are designed communities next slide so the question of how meaning attention and value are connected um, can be linked to this idea of the pretty cool problem uh, as as walker describes that consumer products are now increasingly uh, the quality of consumed products, the average quality is quite high. And so the difference between something, difference between products is increasingly produced by brand value. And so, um, and by what Kevin Kelly calls intangible value. Those intangible values can be linked to political stands, ethical qualities, the relationship of the brand within workers and the idea of authenticity. We can think of a brand such as Patagonia, which is politically engaged for the environment in South America. Uh, it uses employee practices. It produces an image of itself as a um, positive uh, labor employer, uh, produces image of as, a, as a social activism and transfers the political values towards the purchase of the product. So these intangibles are semiotic markers, elements that convey meaning and that people purchase when purchasing a Patagonia jacket, they're also purchasing a, a, um, a set of meanings. Next slide, please. Okay. You can read that slide and you understand what this is just a recap of what we've been saying. So brands are increasingly distinguished by systems of meaning, symbols, words, and images generated by stories, dissimulated in media content, which then conveys ethical and cultural values. Communication processes allow the consumer to adhere to the brand narrative while brand gains more control over their attention, while brands gain more control, excuse me. Next slide. iTunes, well, this is out of date, but Apple Music holds an infinite supply of songs that can be produced at no cost. Their products are infinitely reproducible and their value and price is not determined by supply and demand, but rather by communication processes. An Apple Music song is different from other forms of property in that it cannot be given away, nor can be inherited. So it's not property in the former sense of what property was, it's sold as an experience. So digital value then is also linked to the rise of cryptocurrencies, of Bitcoin, an example, is where, where the value is also determined to some extent by the amount of attention and the communication process around cryptocurrencies is essential to their construction of value. Next, li next slide, please. So then I'm repeating what I already told you earlier, um, this whole idea of what's, how do we conceive of value now? 
uh, supply and demand is a model which is no longer universally applicable. The theory of, of the labor production constituting value has become more and more difficult with globalization and a very large gap between the cost of production and, and retail cost and the, and the cost of consumption. So uh, these theories of supply of, of value are being challenged by the rise of digital communication technologies and the economic and cultural transformation linked to them. We've seen above how brands are becoming increasingly abstract and less linked to concrete objects. This is also true of digital products. The calculation of the value of digital products does not fit either of these theories. Next slide. Even material goods, not digital goods, value is increasingly determined by communication rather than demand, a demand supply relationship. As the industrial and agricultural processes linked to globalization make goods progressively cheaper and luxury goods more available. Next slide. So, I mean, I spoke about this before briefly, but Lazzarotto has held this whole idea of immaterial labor coming from Terra Nova and out of the Italian autonomous. And the whole idea of immaterial labor is that increasingly, uh, not only consumers, but even uh, workers or freelancers are required to somehow adhere to the brand and become producers of content for the brand and, and are supposed to somehow receive uh, satisfaction through the um, through the emotional effective relationship of being connected to the to the ethic or the ethos of the brand we can see that in a brand such as lush i don't know if you're familiar with lush in poland but lush is a cosmetics brand which has built its whole branding around very simple packaging um natural products and so on but above all about being a defender of animal rights which is nothing much to do with the product but it's a way of producing and shaping attention next slide please uh and of course in that process the shift of labor towards the consumer uh uber airbnb uh, airlines uh has involved in also each consumer becoming a brand being measured being studied by other consumers and producing the sense of, of their own ethos so they're required to produce communicational value from actions lifestyles and behavior and Lazarato discusses how production and consumption are no longer separate, but increasingly linked in a digital economy that uses social media. He argues that communication is now central to all of these processes and indeed the production of value. The process of production of communication tends to become immediately the process, process of valorization. Next slide, please. So there's a sort of thing of doing labor for the brand in terms of the prestige of being associated brand. Uh, so Lazarado argues that in fact, what the, this economy of attention producing is subjectivity. So that's ways of being a human being. Where an economic system moves more towards trading, if you want, in identities and communication. And these link to our attention. So we can think about this in terms of the, the construction of sexual uh, identities, racial identities, ethnic identities, political identities, environmental identities. Um, so this production of a certain self-awareness of a so and a production of, of one's own uh, of how one manages one's attention. Next slide, please. So we increasingly pay for things with our attention. 
as I said earlier, Christian Fuchs argues that we should be paid for this labor when we, for example, for simply being on Facebook. On the contrary, the audience's attention interaction is the base of the internet company's profits. Generally, we can say the higher the total attention time given to ads, the higher Google and Facebook profits tend to be. Attention time is determined by the size of a target group and the average time this group spends on the platforms. We're now, of course, in the United States seeing things that are not available in, um, in Europe, such as the matching of eye movements on screens with credit card behavior. So that what we actually do is measuring attention beyond us being time and number individuals and demographics to measuring the eye movements allow the measurement of, of actual attention and then linking that to, um, to consumption habits with the credit card. So attention time is determined by the size of target group, the average time this group spends on the platforms. This conglomerate of the attention becomes habits and management of these human habits of attention is increasingly centralized in international cooperation and is essential to the calculation of their stock value. Next slide, please. So the semiotic process of branding has become the central means, one of the central means of production of economic value. Brands produce more than enticements to buy products. They produce stories which people identify and social practices where people behave in ways the brand encourages. He defines plans as platforms for action. Hilburn uh, goes further and argues that they operate as a type of governmentality, managing human behavior. Next slide, please. That may be it. Next slide. So overall, my argument is that the attention economy has been too much understood in the structure of information and not enough around the concept of communication. So, uh, so much of the economy theory, as I've said before, depend on the notion of, of information exchange. Um, but we argue that attention is defined as mental, um, so they define attention as mental awareness. Okay, they, they argue value is determined by attention and scarcity. Attention is scarce, but goods are not. There are a key problem in this conceptualization of attention economy through the information transmission model. What Davenport, Cra Beck, uh, Crawford, Albinson argue ignores what we call ritual. Sometimes they argue that the cybernetic model of information transmission, uh, and this has been inadequate for understanding human improvement processes. Next slide. The problem of the Shannon and Weaver model, which is the sender sends information in a message to a receiver, right, that there are no power relations between sender and receiver, sender and receiver. And it assumes there's a willing communication on each basis. This may have been true for telegraph in the past, but it's not, for, it's not true for social media. That is the relationship between sender and receiver Reba is constituted mutually by relationships of force and desire. Lazzarato argues that communication involves subject formation, the formation of both sender and receiver. The sender does not exist as a neutral agent transmitting information, but is created in the process of communication, as is the consumer is created in the process of consumation. Their identity is formed in that process through what we can see as somehow ritualistic. Next slide, please. So in thinking about that, we can think about perhaps the idea of ritual and James Carey's idea that communication is always being conceived to either as information transmission or as ritual. So that much is discussed in the attention economy involves rituals. So rituals involve the reciprocal transformation of senders and receivers and messages through the communication process and indeed the formation of communities. So if we understand rituals in religion, rituals in religion where the individual feels they are transformed, for example, 
by eating the host as the body of Jesus, and at the same time connects to a community other people performing the same ritual. So that the reciprocal transformation occurs through this process. Attention is not simply a rational receiver of messages, has its possession and invests in different objects, but it's constitutes constituent of the receiver's being and shaped by his and her acts of communication. Attention is linked to the values, narratives, and symbols that are constituted of that identity. Next slide, please. So the neoliberal economy, if you can, again, I suggest reading Georg Frankel on this, has been linked clearly to the rise of the commodification of attention. National economies are being supplanted by global economies where attention is organized by using big data on a world scale. Global brands behave like a medium in the same way that television did for the nation or still does, meaning a form of imagined transnational rather than national community. Brands now produce content rather than the incitement to buy. And Benetton was the first company to perhaps do this starting in the 90s when Semprini's study talked about how Benetton moved from actually showing any products to, to selling value. So Benetton ran a famous campaign showing people who are about to be executed in the United States, an anti-death uh, penalty campaign, which had nothing to do with the product, but attracted attention. Next slide, please. So the encouragement of audience participation in which was originally a sort of left wing dream of all audiences becoming active and controlling their own content in, in, in brand content has produced has been happened also because websites, mobile devices and all digital forms allow this process. So the post national media use globally available media such as YouTube and Netscape. And the audiences are often transnational. And these audiences are often, say, mediated by, by such uh, celebrities, such as Oprah Whitney, who's moved from being a talk to a host on American television to being a brand, or indeed in a system of managing the self available in many countries. And recently, she's disrupted Britain with an interview of Meghan Markle. Next slide. So the management of attention is becoming an important factor. Uh, and how this attention is managed to linking brand. Uh, now, Rachel Uber, her name is missing there, has talked about how public is willing to give information to brands, but not to the National Security Agency that there isn't a fear of brands accumulating data in the same way as there is for government organizations. Indeed, willingly participate. People increasingly willingly give their information, give their attention to brands, where they're much less likely to do so to organizations linked to the state. Next paragraph, next slide, I've almost finished. So here we come back to this idea of interpassivity. The more someone active in Facebook, the more they can be pleasured and studied, measured and studied. Profiles can be made of them, what they like and so on. So Facebook is able to sell this information or use it for habit. A habit on Facebook can be then used to be a habit for Spotify. And then a genre of music can be then used for consumer products linked to this music genre. Again, we have this concept of shifting from one domain to another. Next slide, please. So this global of attention can be monetized more and more. A good example is um, Orange Bank in France or in Africa. Orange is a major international uh, telecom corporation it's now moving its capital from its subscriber base to to its services into being a, a, a consumer bank an entirely digital bank uh, apple has developed um, 
payment systems, electric wallets. So what we're moving towards is that once one controls a certain amount of audience or public, one can then move into more and more intangible and lucrative forms of value production. Next slide. And then of course, this is linked also to cryptocurrencies, which are also linked to maintaining and constructing um, audiences. All to do with developing this post-national order. Next slide, please. So as this happens, as the more global economy, nations and cities are becoming more and more brands and encouraged to compete for investment capital, for tourism, and so on. So that consumption and production melt into communication and information becomes a secondary issue. This occurs through media rituals, consumer labor. Last slide, I think, is the next one. So just what I said before, cities themselves become systems of a, a sort of market and brands are seen as blue chip moments in a flow of attention. The global appeal penetrates local cultures. So the attention economy influences not only a dematerialized culture, but actual real space and how cities are designed and lived in and how people experience them. So finally, value is produced by our attention. It was not simply a limited resource in relationship to information. It's something that's produced by communication involving ritual transformation of the self. And here it's the narratives and symbols dominated by beliefs. I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very lo lots of information to process. Thank you very much for that. Uh, do, How did do I we do have... it? Getting your attention. <laughs> uh, so do, do we have questions? Uh, well, I have some, uh, I'm curious about a few things. Uh, I'm curious to what your take on this is. Uh, we don't have much time, I think, for the questions for set, but we have some time. So uh, one thing, uh, I find curious uh, nowadays is I see that some brands try to expand to as many types of different content and stuff as possible. And what I find is interesting is that it seems that for some types of content, it seems like, uh, well, the content is monetized and it uses the brand for the attention uh, to sell itself, let's say. Um, but for the other types of content, it seems like the other way around. It's just content that is placed somewhere to attract some more attention from a new audience to the brand in general, so that it then may be used for some different content that is monetized. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, most prevalent when, uh, when I think about some new video games online, for example, that are now uh including these small uh some i don't know characters from some type of media or something like that uh so i'm curious do you think uh, with the you know attention being scarce as it is is this something most brands will have to do now like try to get to as many kinds of content uh, and types of audiences as possible or is it still possible for brands to survive by just focusing on their main uh, thing? Yes, I think certainly I see these processes of change as sedimentary and not replacing. So traditional consumer industrial brands, of course, continue and will continue. Traditional forms of producing audience, such as national television stations, continue and produce content. And there's still a market for the attention they produce if they're in a commercial system. It's, it's not as strong a market as it was 30 years ago, but it's still a market, okay? Um, so it's not a question of one replacing the other. It's a, a series of sedimentary levels. 
Um, there's two responses to your question. I'm not sure if you're referring to gamification, where brands participate in games or produce games with the purpose of strengthening people's consumption of other products. Is that what you mean? Or are you referring to how games offer free services in order to strengthen the, the reputation of the game? Which of those two are you referring to? So what I'm referring to is uh, there are now some largely popular games that basically uh, try to evolve and not like just stay in place, but they introduce new content periodically. Mm -hmm. And some of this content is something licensed from some larger brands. So in a way, these uh, games sort of become a, some platform that brands can uh, put their own content in. So can you, can you do e-commerce on them? Can you buy the product immediately? Yes, sometimes, yes, sometimes, yes. And sometimes... It's the dream of the MIT Media Lab in the 2000s, you know, to produce a television series where you could touch anything on the screen and buy it. So, you know, it's, it's a literal... Of course, that never happened, but it's a literal transformation of attention and creating a brand world, which when people want to, to, to purchase that brand world and to make it a virtual world to try and make that virtual world real, it offers you that potential. But, so I'm not quite sure what your question is. It's an interesting process, but um, you know, I think there's that process and there's also the process how classic brands can use games and introduce themselves through games. Um, that's not always been so successful it's a difficult task consumers are often quite smart at detecting they're trying to be seduced by cheap tricks mm. okay thank you very much um the one other thing i'm considering is uh so with the with the pandemic now uh, one thing that happened is that people on average tend to have more time uh, uh, there are some reports on that, let's say like 15% more time or something like that, that they tend to spend online. So it kind of, there was this uh, narrative that was uh, uh, slowly spreading versus that there's no, not, uh, there's no more attention basically left. Like people don't have any time for anything more, any more content. You know, with the pandemic, it seems that it slightly changed. Like gave some more space to introduce new stuff. Um, so I'm wondering if you see any impact on what brands do, uh, how they uh, tackle this situation uh, in terms of trying to find attention in the market. Hmm. I'm not sure I can answer your question, but the first thing I would say is that what of this is produced is uh, an acceleration of electronic purchasing of e-commerce and so that the process of purchasing and delivering products becomes much faster and immediate so to some extent uh, brands have profited from this process the second i would say is i don't buy that there's this sort of limited idea of attention i think attention might be it's not information that's infinite, but maybe attention. And maybe the whole model is wrong. But I haven't sufficiently conceptualized that to argue that seriously, but that's my intuition to rethink about it. So uh, arguing that all the attention is gone is no, there's, there's attention is generated in this process of communication. For example, I mean, um, this is not a, a very simple example, is when you fall in love, you have a lot of energy, <laughs> produces this energy. So that when you fall in love with a product, perhaps you have a lot of energy for that. So the process of making you fall in love with a product or want something desperately produces attention. It just doesn't take an existing framework of attention. Attention is, 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 is being generated constantly by narrative, and by identities and imagining imagined identities. Does that make sense? I think I see your point. Uh, I think it's uh, partly like uh, I'm 
from a very economic background, so my notion of what the attention could be is perhaps somewhat different, like how you define attention. But I see, I see your point. I see your point. Well, if somebody is taken over by a passion, all their attention goes towards that thing for some time. So, so that generates it. Now you can then try to move that attention towards another product or another thing, but you first have to generate it. And when that's being generated, it, it can be um, like a nuclear explosion. Do you understand? It can be a massive amount of energy that can be directed or not directed towards other things. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's not like it's sitting there <laughs> It, it is in a process of constant transformation. Attention can't remain still, or, or it's dead. Yeah, I see. Mm. So the, the way I thought about attention previously is probably um, more tied to time uh, itself and just how much time people can spend on different things. So. At some point, even if they want to give attention, you know, to all this content that is there and to all the brands, that at some point, uh, well, there is no more time anymore. Right? The day has to end, and the next day they start all over. Uh, but you know, there's some limit to just how much attention they can give. Mm. Uh, but you know, the North Korean gaming, uh, sorry, South Korean gaming industry. He's producing the idea of you know people playing 20 hours a day um generate you know to, the experience of time is not that simple yes you're That's right true. in a sense it's limited but it's not limited in a very clear or defined way it expands and contracts according to human desire and fear That's, That's true. a very economistical thing to say but <laughs> <laughs> No, it's true. Everyone would have their own like attention supply. Let's call it right. So, but yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, you. For for those who will be watching this later as a recording, please feel free also to perhaps send questions if that's all right. With you. Sure. And well, thank you very much for agreeing to talk about this. You're welcome. Have a good afternoon. Bye. You too. Thank you. Thank you for Bye. inviting me. And I hope we can continue with this, perhaps also with our, uh, the last speakers from, from Spain. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.